So just before we get into it today, you just clicked on a video all about business. And if you love business, and who doesn't, then you might like my new channel, Business Blaze. It's a business-themed channel, and we cover topics like why the £50 note in the UK is pretty much just for criminals, and what exactly happens at Enron, and much more. But this isn't a channel quite like today I found out. It's facts, but it's also got a healthy dose of silliness mixed in as well. If you want me to just give you the facts straight, and you hate fun, well, Business Blaze is probably not for you. But if you like facts and fun together, well, you're probably gonna like it. There's a link to a recent video below, and let's get into today's video. In 1933 and 1934, an alleged plot to overthrow the government of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, by Wall Street bankers may have happened. While contemporary newspapers called it a gigantic hoax, others, including the House's Special Committee on Un-American Activities, found the allegations credible. You decide. During the campaign of 1932, FDR's promise of jobs for the unemployed frightened businessmen who feared he would turn their capitalist nation socialist and engage in what they viewed as reckless government spending. To add insult to injury, one of Roosevelt's first economic acts as president was to abandon the gold standard in 1933. Conservatives were outraged. As Senator Henry D. Hatfield wrote, This is despotism. This is tyranny. This is the annihilation of liberty. The ordinary American is thus reduced to the status of a robot. The president has not merely signed the death warrant of capitalism, but has ordained the mutilation of the Constitution unless the Friends of Liberty, regardless of party, band themselves together to regain their lost freedom. Some joined together to form the American Liberty League with the intent of showing the value of encouraging people to work, encouraging people to get rich. Members included some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in the country at the time, such as Irene Pierre and Lamont Dupont, John W. Davis, former presidential candidates and lawyer to J.P. Morgan, Alfred Sloan of General Motors, and Al Smith, a prominent New York politician. According to those who believed there was a plot, several members of the League, fearful of the socialistic and communistic, in their mind, reforms FDR intended, they planned to overthrow his administration. The plotters included a DuPont, a former presidential candidate, a former governor of New York, Wall Street bankers, and a director of Bethlehem Steel. Two members of this Wall Street putsch were Gerald McGuire, a well-connected bond salesman and commander of the Connecticut American Legion, and William Doyle, also a former American Legion. Commander. At this time in the US, in the midst of the Great Depression, fascism was not seen as an entirely bad thing by a number of Americans. In fact, one historian has noted, the success of Huey Long, the popular and powerful governor of Louisiana, seemed evidence that fascism could come from within, and with the acquiescence of the people. In fact, advocates of the right-wing style government believed they had a ready militia just waiting for them in the posts of the American Legion. As one Emily Marshall wrote in her The Forgotten and treason, the plot to overthrow FDR. The impoverished but well-trained veterans of the First World War were the ideal candidates for a fascist militia, and through the American Legion, they were already organized and uniformed, with nearly a million members. So this brings us to General Smedley Butler. Without a doubt, Butler was an American hero. Joining the Marines at the age of 16, he did a stint in Cuba in 1898 and was noted for outstanding heroism during the Boxer Rebellion, later added not one but two Medals of Honor, and pretty much continued to shine throughout his career until rising to the rank of Major General after a few decades of serving. No lapdog to the establishment, Butler frequently came afoul of the powers that be. For example, in 1932, he defended the Bonus Marchers, a protest of 20,000 impoverished World War I veterans camped out in Washington, D.C., trying to obtain benefits. Butler was very popular with the veterans and was frequently asked to speak to veterans' groups. In an address to a conversation of the American Legion in 1931, Butler stated, I spent 33 years being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism, purifying Nicaragua for the international banking house. In 1909 to 1912, Mexico for American oil interests in 1916, the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916, Haiti and Cuba for the National City Boys. I helped in the rape of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. 
Butler remained an advocate for soldiers' rights and continued to lecture against war profiteering and his fear that fascism was rising in the United States. This all brings us to the business plot itself. Most of the record of the plot comes from General Butler's testimony before the House's Special Committee, McCormack Dickstein Committee. He claims that in 1933 he was approached by Doyle and McGuire under the guise of helping reform the American Legion. The beginning of the plot required Butler to plant two to three hundred regular legionnaires in the audience at the annual convention, encourage them to make a fuss, and then emerge and make a speech written for him by Doyle and McGuire. When asked where the money to transport the soldiers to Chicago would come from, Butler says McGuire told him, Oh, we have friends that include Grayson Murphy. Butler demurred, but was later approached by Robert Clark, heir to the Singer Sewing Machine Fortune, who explained that the speech was important to their plan to return America to the gold standard. He stated, I do not want to lose my fortune. I am willing to spend half to save the other half. If you go out and make this speech in Chicago, I am certain that they will adopt the resolution, and that will be one step towards the return to gold. Butler refused to give the speech. After the convention, in November 1933, McGuire approached Butler again, this time to lead a great big super organization to maintain the democracy, which he described later as a French organization of super soldiers. McGuire reportedly told Butler the soldiers would support the president by seeing that he doesn't change the method of financing the government. The plot, according to Butler, also involved the installation of an assistant president, a secretary of general affairs, to help the overworked and disabled FDR, about whom, to quote, everybody can tell that the president's health is failing and the dumb American people will fall for it in a second. Butler never joined the plot, but spoke with his friends and Philadelphia record reporter Paul Cumley French about it. French investigated in September 1934 and testified that when asked, McGuire told him that, We need a fascist government in this country. The only men who have the patriotism to do it are the soldiers, and Smedley Butler is the ideal leader. He could organize a million men overnight. French corroborated the remainder of Butler's story. Somehow Congress got wind of the plot and called General Butler and French to testify in November 1934. After the plot was revealed, the knives came out, and in New York, the story was that it was all just a big misunderstanding. In fact, the mayor, Fiorello Lagardia, spoke with the Associated Press on November 22, 1934, which reported, Mayor Lagardia of New York laughingly described today the charges of General Smedley D. Butler that New York brokers suggested that he lead an army of 500,000 ex-servicemen on Washington as a cocktail putsch. The mayor indicated he believed that someone at a party had suggested the idea to the ex-Marine as a joke. That said, after extensive investigation, a congressional committee investigating the matter concluded, in the last few weeks of the committee's official life, it received evidence showing that certain persons had made an attempt to establish a fascist organization in this country. There is no question that these attempts were discussed, were planned, and might have been placed in execution when and if the financial backers deemed it expedient. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, why not go check out my new channel, Business Plays? I'm going to link to a video from that channel below. And thank you for watching.